The Supreme Court is back in the spotlight with the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the recent nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Republicans and Democrats on the Hill are both gearing up for another judiciary fight. But what is the role of the Supreme Court and what is fair and not fair in our fight for the judiciary? Adam Carrington is professor, assistant professor of politics at Hillsdale College, and he joins us today to break down those questions and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen, and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm Sam Chen. The Supreme Court is back in the spotlight with the recent passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the president's nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the highest court. The debate between our, over our judges, our judiciary, and their role is now back in the spotlight on Capitol Hill. But what are the role of our judges? What is the role of our judges? And what's fair and not fair in these judiciary hearings? as well as what's the deal with some of these recent calls for packing the court, cries of hypocrisy, and so forth. We'll be breaking all of that down tonight, and joining us is friend of the program, Dr. Adam Carrington, Assistant Professor of Politics at Hillsdale College. Dr. Carrington, welcome to the program. Glad to be back. Thanks for having me. It's always good to have you. And uh, before we get started, uh, 2020 has been such a chaotic year. How are you and your family doing? We're, we're very blessed. We've, of course, had to learn what it means to all uh, work, live, and play uh, together without being able to go outside for a little bit. But compared to how some other people are have had to suffer under this, either financially or health-wise, uh, we've been very in fact, we added a new addition to the family in the midst of the pandemic, a, a daughter, Mary Elizabeth. So I, I, I have to say that, that uh, especially compared to how hard this has been for others we've been very well taken care of well that is wonderful news congratulations uh 2020 is not all bad and so that's that's just great great news um i, I want to begin asking you obviously the this entire supreme court fight for people like you and, and i we we are enamored by the judiciary on a regular basis but for the majority of americans the supreme court fight is is back and it's really because of the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, you study constitutional law, you study the court more in detail than most. What is the lasting legacy that Justice Ginsburg leaves this court and our country? Well, she is going to go down as a giant in the legal profession and a giant on the court. And a giant in the legal profession in part because of the fact that she was in many ways the first or nearly the first woman to break many ceilings mm -hmm. and create a path for other women to participate in the legal field more uh, than, than before. And the fact that as a Supreme Court justice, not only was she the second woman to be appointed to the court, she was also a legal giant in two ways, I'd say. One, that she was a very effective writer, uh, Justice Scalia, who disagreed with her a lot, but also had a, uh, a good friendship with her, noted how good she was in litigating questions and pushing people before the court to correctly state their case. And then also, I would say that she became an icon of the more, uh, I'd say, progressive wing of the party, the uh, perspective of maybe the more Democratic nominees, that she really became a leader in that group and therefore really defined how that part of the court saw itself, how it motioned and 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 how it tried to argue its case about what the constitution and the law should mean yeah uh certainly a career whether you agree with her or disagree with her certainly a career uh and a lasting legacy to be admired and um you know we certainly mourn with with uh, the family and um and with the country at, at her passing um the there's obviously been a a debate about her replacement and the president has nominated Judge Amy Coney Barrett of the Seventh Circuit. 
uh, who he nominated to the circuit. And, and so she has spent most of her career as a law professor at the University of Notre Dame Law School. Judge Coney Barrett, uh, well, first of all, before we get to the debate over her, what, what are your impressions of the judge uh, about her of her nomination? And what are the kind of the first impressions that you had when you heard the news? Well, I think that you've got to look at a nomination on two levels, especially in 2020. There certainly was the idea that there were political advantages for President Trump to nominate her based on both the constituencies that he is trying to court and having a a woman justice uh, to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. At the same time, what I've been more interested in is her approach to judging. Mm-hmm. and that she has a very defined approach that is very much in the uh, in the light or in the in the mold she says of the man that she uh, clerked for when when a supreme court clerk that was justice scalia and the fact that everyone who has seen her whether they agree with her or not has been impressed with her and as and that she has tended to be the top of any group she's been a part of whether it be undergraduate law school law professor and as a judge in fact it was very interesting to see noah feldman at harvard who said basically in an op-ed i disagree with everything she probably stands for yet she deserves to be on because i've hardly met a, a more brilliant mm. legal mind in my life and so i think those are the things that i think have been very interesting uh, to consider and things that i think the public are considering as well okay. One of the criticisms of the judge has been coming from uh, Democrats has has pointed back to the legacy of Justice Ginsburg that you and I are talking about and and arguing that Amy Coney Barrett is the kind of judge that will undo everything Justice Ginsburg stood for and fought for. What do you make of arguments like that? Well, I think that it comes down at least in its better form to a question of judicial philosophy that uh, yes uh, amy coney barrett while i believe from comments she's made herself deeply respects ruth bader ginsburg is thankful for the opportunity she opened up that she does have a different legal philosophy than ruth bader ginsburg and i think that rather than making Uh, Ginsburg's legacy sacrosanct or saying, and I think this would be a bit condescendingly, that all women should have the same point of view because of their gender, that really what we should be arguing is um, between these two brilliant women, who do we think had the better judicial philosophy? And I think, yes, uh, Barrett's going to have different views. Mm -hmm. She's going to come down in different ways, but it really should be a a discussion of who has the better view of the role of a judge, the role of the Constitution, the role of the law. Okay. And the other, the other issue that we see brought up and, and it came up during her hearing for her appellate court nomination to the Seventh Circuit was issues with her religion. And the argument is that she's she's devoutly Catholic, member of a group called the People of Praise, which has been falsely attributed to being the basis for The Handmaid's Tale. That, that has been widely debunked. But there's this notion that she's devout in this group that maybe has practices that a lot of us do not practice and so forth. And during the hearing, you remember Senator Dianne Feinstein, California, saying that her dogma li- lived loudly and within her. Uh, Senator Kamala Harris uh, has, in questioning uh, other Catholic nominees to the court, has have asked about uh, associations with the Knights of Columbus. Um, that was with with the uh, now Judge Bruce Boucher. Um, Senator Maisie Harino from uh, Hawaii had actually asked uh, then nominee, now Judge Boucher, if he would leave the Knights of Columbus in order to take his his judiciary role. Now, obviously, Article Six of the Constitution forbids a religious test for to hold office does not forbid senators from asking these questions. How fine of a line are we walking here and how much on their faith should these senators focus? Is it fair? Is it not fair? What's your take on on that? I mean, that's what we've been seeing in the news right now. What's your take on questions regarding her faith and practices? Yeah, I think this shows a bit of the divide between those people who do have a strong faith system and those who are agnostic or atheist, that there's a lot of misunderstanding between them. 
But as far as the constitutional question, I think that the line needs to be status, who you are, versus action or belief, what are you going to do in relation to your job? And I think the the plain fact that she is Roman Catholic shouldn't be something that keeps her from being seriously considered on the court. I think if for someone to say that merely because you are part of a faith group, you shouldn't be considered is is wrong and would be a violation of the constitutional principle. Uh, at the same time, I think respectfully, what is legitimate is to ask how ju- the judge would approach constitutional questions. Would she take into account certain Uh, principles, would she take into account her religious beliefs and how so, I think that's legitimate as part of the broader question. Now, by the way, um, Barrett has said that her approach is to say that she will interpret the law and the Constitution as written, Mm -hmm. as it was originally meant when it came into play or when it was enacted. And that she doesn't believe that her religious belief should actually be a defining issue and that a judge and that as a judge, that would be something she would separate. So I think it's legitimate to ask how judges come to their conclusions and weigh whether they're legitimate. It's not legitimate to say that merely because someone is a part of a faith group that makes them suspect or someone that shouldn't be considered. Sure. And it reminds me of uh, what then nominee now. Justice Gorsuch has said a judge who likely who judge who likes every result he reaches is very likely a bad judge reaching for results he prefers rather than the results the law compels. Uh, Dr. Carrington, that, that's really, really good insight, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, I want to continue this conversation. We're going to go to the break, but I want to continue it when we come back. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Dr. Carrington, thank you again for being with us. And, I want to continue the conversation right where we left off, talking about Judge Coney Barrett's upcoming hearing. And you were talking about where this, what should senators be asking with regards to uh, things like her religion. Um, we were talking about Article 6 of the Constitution. I want to ask you just more broadly then, uh, what is, you know, we hear every time a senator comes up, we hear about all these different issues. What would you do on health care? What would you do on Brown v. Board of Education? What would you do on Roe v. Wade? And more and more we hear the term litmus test coming up. Uh, and and it's, everyone seems to be against litmus tests on the surface, but then everyone seems to have their own pet exception that, that they would like to use as a litmus test. What is a litmus test? Um, and what is, does it have a place in these judicial nominee, uh, nomination hearings? Right. The, 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 at least the phrase litmus test, as it has come to be used in the this context, is to basically say there is a case with an underlying constitutional question or issue that is basically a a a, a t- that basically a justice has to affirm or deny to be fit for the court and you're right that one of the biggest ones right now is the question of Roe v Wade that uh declared a constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy. Uh, others, such as maybe Brown v. Board of Education when it comes to segregation, or maybe even going way back, your view of Dred Scott, mm-hmm. the case that in many ways precipitated the Civil War, those those would be the kind of questions. And w- whether they, they have a place, I think that in and of themselves, I would say no. Instead, I think that getting justices to talk about the reasoning of those cases and whether that reveals a bad approach to judging and a bad approach to the Constitution, I think that's where you could have something like a litmus test, but not are you going to straight vote up or down on a particular case? I think the bigger question should be, what does your opinion about a certain case reveal about your approach to your job and your approach to the documents that you're going to be applying uh, in, in, in this very important context? And that gets to the idea that judges don't see themselves as politicians voting yes or no on policy pieces. Uh, how do judges on the bench see themselves and how should we be evaluating them? Well, I think there is some difference in how judges can sometimes see themselves. But I think for the most part, I think the the, the, the way that many of them speak of this is to, is to ask the question, and this is a question I would probably ask Barrett if I was a senator and could, how do you see being a judge 
as being different from being a congressperson or being a president. Hmm. That would be my first question. And you're right that I think judges at least see to some degree that how they may vote on a case is going to be different than how they might vote on it if they were a voter in the ballot box, if they were a president, if they were a member of Congress, meaning that they are supposed to follow the law as Congress voters and presidents have have enacted them and not as they would do if they were in that position. And that changes what you might do. The second thing is to ask the question, what is what do you believe the Constitution means as far as how to interpret it? How do you get at what its phrases, its structure uh, what, uh, pretend uh, for particular cases? What, how do you do that for regular statutes? And I think that's the kind of questions that we should be asking uh, uh, Judge Barrett and judges before and after to really get a sense of not do we agree with this person in general, but do we think they would do a good job as a judge? Uh, and I think we're, we're seeing, to your point, a lot of intersections of politics and and the judiciary, which may not be healthy for an independent judiciary. Uh, along those lines, one of the things that, that we're hearing with regard to this, this particular nomination it, are cries of hypocrisy. And this is going back to the passing of Justice Ginsburg's friend on the court, Justice Scalia, and the original nomination by President Obama of Judge Merrick Garland, which at the time Republicans refused to grant a hearing to. And now they're grant, granting a hearing in an election year uh, to Judge Coney Barrett. You have written that Senator McConnell, the majority leader of the Senate, is not being hypocritical, but other Republicans like Senator Graham are. C can you elaborate on that a little bit? Right. And maybe the place to start just very quickly is to say hypocrisy is not banned in the Constitution, <laughs> uh, meaning that the president, as long as he is president and the current senators, as long as they are senators, can any time they still hold their offices, a nominate, consent and appoint a justice. Regardless of whether you think that's fair or not, that's mm -hmm. the constitutional system. So that's until they all leave office, they can do that. Mm -hmm. But they have tried to define McConnell and, and other senators why it's fair to act as they have. And I think uh, in the case of uh, Senator McConnell, he laid out criteria beyond it just being an election year. He said President Obama in 2016 was a lame duck president. The previous election had been in the Senate, very good for the Republican Party, the opposition party, and therefore for th a set of criteria, this was a good time to uh, wait and allow the American people to decide who should make the next choice. And not all those criteria are the case this time. Mm -hmm. The uh, President Trump is not a lame duck yet. Mm -hmm. The 2018 elections went very well for Democrats in the House, but the Republicans picked up seats in the Senate. So I think that McConnell would be hypocritical if the Republicans got clobbered in the next election and in the lame duck session, they mm. tried to do it anyway. But for now, I don't think so. Other senators like say Lindsey Graham, who basically unequivocally said, this shouldn't be done in an election year. I think they are very clearly being hypocritical. But Senator McConnell, I think, was much more careful with his standards and at least for now has not been. And could you make the same argument that Democrat leadership is being hypocritical and the idea that we need they would say we need nine. Do your job with with Judge Garland and now saying we have to wait. I mean, isn't doesn't the same argument apply? Absolutely. I think that the, 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 there have been a lot there's been a lot of hypocrisy on both sides and even even Vice President Biden, some of his old statements from the 90s, early 90s uh, could come back and haunt him here. And I think that that really separates those who are playing politics from those who are at least trying to think constitutionally about this is to say that uh, um, you really should have a consistent standard for what's fair both ways. And unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of politics being played from both angles. One of the other things that's coming up, speaking of politics being played in the judiciary, is this idea of packing the court. And we all studied it in history. President Roosevelt attempted to do it. Uh, but what is packing the court? You're seeing this, this is a drive led by some Senate Democrats, including Senator Harris. And the Vice President has not commented, uh, Vice President Biden has not commented one way or the other this year. Up, to, uh, up until 2019, he had been adamantly opposed to it. 
But what is packing the court and what's your take on on what this does to the judiciary? Packing the court is an inherently negative term normally, mm -hmm. and what it says, what what it means is the idea of the court not being composed the way you would like it, with the kind of votes and approaches the Constitution and the laws you would like. So you add Supreme Court seats to try to up the number of people that agree with you to start to get the results you want. Now, I will say. The U.S. Constitution doesn't say how many members the Supreme Court must have. That is set by Congress. It has been different across different parts of U.S. history. There have been moments where the court has been expanded and shrunk for very political reasons. And uh, I think – but I would say that um, this is, is in general a bad idea. And we have had nine Supreme Court justices since 1869. We have had it for actually 180 of our 230 years with the wow. Supreme Court. And the real question that we should be asking about the number of justices is how many justices are needed to adequately take on the caseload that a court is looking at? And how few do we need to make sure that they are able to deliberate with each other? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of questions that aren't being asked and by them not being asked i think it's exposing that this is much more political than thinking about the institutional health of a co-equal branch of the united states government uh, what are your fears with i mean are, are are there fears with if if they do choose to pack the pact court and congress kind of just green lights that when the court disagrees with the president which is what happened in with with president roosevelt this time it's the idea of they don't want a nominee that might tip the scales is there a fear of what might the court become if if this just starts to become go the way of the judicial filibuster that just it goes away and this kind of becomes the norm? Yeah, I think if you go back to the American founding in Federalist seventy eight, Alexander Hamilton said that the dis one of the distinctions between lawmaking and the courts is lawmakers exercise will while the courts exercise judgment. Now, what's the distinction there? It means that lawmakers in enacting laws do what they think, what they want. Mm -hmm. They enact their desires or their what they think is best. Judges in exercising judgment set aside their will as best they can. They're human, so it's going to be imperfect. But they try to set aside their will to only apply the will of another meaning the will of the people through their representatives. Mm -hmm. And the more you pack the court or constrict the court or do other uh, sort of mechanisms like this purely to try to get the result you want, the more you start to make the court act and be seen and maybe even see itself as another ju another legislative branch. And I think that undermines the separation of powers, it undermines the structure our constitution has, and it in some ways makes the court superfluous because mm -hmm. it would be fulfilling a job that already should be being done by Congress. Uh, that's a really good insight. Dr. Carrington, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing that insight with us. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Dr. Carrington, thank you again for your time. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the research you're doing now. And you've written a book, Justice Stephen Fields' Cooperative Constitution of Liberty, Liberty and Fool. And I understand you're working now on, on, on the second book. I am. So the first book really was trying to get through one justice at the idea of what liberty is and maybe expand on it. What I've really turned to now is I'm looking at early federal court judges, and by early federal court judges, I mean before the Civil War, and trying to get at the questions similar to what we were just talking about. What is the judicial power? And trying to both make it more theoretical. I think that while we have a kind of 30,000-foot view of what it means to make laws, execute, and interpret or apply them. We really need to get into the weeds of what that theory means. And my hope is by looking at how, as our country was first developing, they looked at this question, mm -hmm. that it can equip us for asking these questions better today and questions of, for example, the role of the bureaucracy and how different branches are supposed to operate. I think past can really inform us to make us better choosers of our future. Sure. 
Let me ask you this, just kind of in sum, uh, when you, you're a constitutional scholar and, and a student of both you know, the government and history. When you look at some of these political debates that we've talked about today, what concerns you about the future of the judiciary and the future of our government? I'm concerned that we only care about results. We only care about getting the policies or outcomes you want. And those matter, by the way. It's mm -hmm. very important to pursue justice. But an insight of our Constitution, an insight from our founding and our history is it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. That governments that don't aren't careful about the structure of their decision making are are, are susceptible to falling prey to their own vices and devices. And that our structure of separation of powers, of federalism, was put in place to make our decision making better, more moderate, more principled, and that to undermine how we make decisions is to ultimately doom us, I think, to making worse decisions. Wow. Well, we look forward to this new book. When it comes out, we'll have you back and, and uh, talk about the book itself. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, well, Dr. Carrington, thank you again for being with us. That is all the time that we have tonight. My thanks to you for tuning in and continue this conversation online. Just use the hashtag Face the Issues. My name is Sam Chen. On behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues, thank you and good night.